Tony, uh, thanks for having a little, well, we've had a little break there, so we can continue and hopefully get this thing put to bed, right. so to speak. Okay, right, uh, gro- <coughs> excuse me, growing up in central Scotland, the only time I got to play an arcade game was really when I was on holiday. Um, the only exposure I had to arcade games out with that was obviously looking at magazines, seeing VG and that kind of stuff. It's only really been since MAME came along that I've actually got to see what all these games were like. I mean, the stuff like Slapshot and all these kind of classic arcade games, I'd never actually got to see the arcade, obviously, until MAME came along. Um, what are your thoughts on MAME? I mean, as far as a, you know, accurately emulating machines and in particular Missile Command, what, do you play a lot of MAME? No, I don't. I, I did in the past. I think it's great. I mean, the fact that there's something... We, we were talking earlier about, um, you know, why don't one of the big companies come up with a, a repository where all these things can, can be played and then monetized so that there's something in it for them and everything's all in one place. And I suppose that's what MAME is. Um, I like it. I, I think it's great. I think the only challenge for MAME really is is being unable to rep- to replicate all of the controls. So the uniqueness of something like Tempest with a spinner or Missile Command with a trackball, I guess it's very difficult to, you know, replicate all of that unless you have one of those great big main cabs with a bloody ironing board on the front of it to, to cover off every every possibility of um, control but you know no I think mm. it's great and I think especially for games like Donkey Kong where guys have been able to hone their skills on main using nothing more than a computer keyboard and maybe a mouse and then being able to to translate to translate that into a live arcade environment I think is is really good um, the current Donkey Kong world record holder, um, I think he just got the record about two weeks ago. He was a main player, and he's only played for the last few years, and he really honed his skills in on on main, and then went to an arcade and dropped the world record. So in that respect, I guess it's a really nice tool, and it, it's also good to be able to play some of the cabs which, which we never saw. So there's there's a whole bunch of classic stuff. I mean, the original Donkey Kong is a great example. I I think I played something called Crazy Kong, which is a sort of bastardized clone cut down <laughs> version of the original Donkey Kong. So it, it, it's 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 great to be able to fire something like like Mame up and and play something like Donkey Kong or Donkey Kong 3 or Donkey Kong Junior. Mm-hmm anything like that um, without actually having to find a cab which as we all know is extremely difficult these days so in that respect I think it's good to be able to enlighten yourself as to what all the fuss was about on certain games just because they happen to not mm-hmm. be in your local area mm-hmm. I know I remember uh, was it Gary Whelan um, who's formerly is he still the world is he still the, the record holder of Galaxian no he's not no. He's kind of disappeared off the radar, hasn't he, as far as... Uh, are you in touch with him at all? I haven't spoken to him for a long time. No. I, <coughs> mm-hmm. I, think he's, I think he's just moved on in life and just been yeah, things. Yeah, you know. done stuff. But I always remember uh, reading an interview with Gary and he basically said that the, the timings of the Galaxian compared to the arcade cab were completely different. How do you find that? Have you, have you tried uh, Missile Command in MAME? I have, yeah. And it, it, it wasn't too bad, but... Um, but again, it's not like the real experience. So unless you're using a mouse, that gives you the element of the analog control. But again, it, it isn't the same as a trackball. No. You, you can move a, a mouse around the screen a lot quicker than you can a trackball. So it, it, it's very difficult to replicate. But I've heard that about a few games, that there are a few games which, which still aren't quite right, either in terms of sound or graphics or gameplay. Um, and things like Robotron, where where the processor they were using on the original board, when it comes under load, it, it, it does slow down slightly. Aye. Whereas obviously on, on main, unless that's programmed in in some way, um, main will play the games like that at a complete full speed with, with, with no slowdown. So um, clearly it's gonna have its challenges, but as a, mm-hmm. as a repository of, of where everything is, mm-hmm. I, you know, I think it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. What's interesting is obviously over the years, I mean, when uh, I've been following MAME since the very, very early days, I think it was uh, 1996 or something, I think it was when it first came out, 
um, there or thereabouts. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, obviously, as, as time wore on, they introduced more features, snapshots, and ultimately uh, saving high scores. But now they've with later versions of MAME, I think probably the last probably ten years they've done away with that because they're saying, well, you know, we were we we've, we've got games that were saving high scores which didn't do it back in the day, and we want to try and replicate it as accurately as possible. In fact, some people would actually say that as as the development of MAME moves on. Games are, that were one time really playable are no longer playable, but it's all to do with the, what what they've actually said. The main team have actually said that being able to play the game is secondary to accurately emulating the timings of all the chips. Yeah. Um, and it's a, a nice side effect, um, which is an interesting thing. But yeah, but um, how many games are on mine now? Must be. Oh, I think you're. I mean, including bootlegs. I mean, I think you're talking about five thousand games. Now. It's just wow. it's just ridiculous. Yeah. That's the, I mean, bootlegs is an interesting one. There's a there's a handful mm -hmm. of bootlegs um, of Missile Command that, again, you know, f for someone interested in the sort of hi historical um, aspect of classic arcade gaming, to be able to play some of the bootlegs is really, really interesting and really useful. Mm -hmm. But personally, uh, well, my, my name, Meme Meister, that says it all. It's, it's my favourite sort of video game thing that exists you know if I was to go to a desert island and I was allowed to take a meme cab or anything else I'd take the meme cab because it's just it's you know it's a fantastic I mean for people like myself who really never got to actually play many arcade games right. um, this is only me now discovering it and so that's my excuse why I'm pretty pissed at most of them I've not had as many years of practice but <laughs> yeah I wonder as well if there's some um, I mean MAME was originally designed purely as an archive and you know, to some extent, it's more of a sort of commercial program now, where um, people are, you know, building main main cabinets and they're dressing them up, and it's it's, it's mm -hmm. almost sort of commercial. But what I like about it is it's a it's a museum, if you like, to what those guys had to do back then. And you know, if I was running a software house today, you know, if if I was managing 20 programmers for the next Grand Theft Auto. I think I'd lock them in a room with a <laughs> copy of MAME for two days and say, you know, pick 50 games and start playing them and, and, and you know, start understanding that actually, whereas now I would assume there are very few limits in terms of what people can do. Back then, there is a limited amount of space and you can't mm -hmm. go over it, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, you can't have an extra five gigabytes of memory because you want to fit in extra textures on the on the windows of the of the reputation <laughs> of Chicago no you can't do that. you know it's it's they managed to get a game and they managed to ca capture people's imaginations out of you know tiny slivers of code and um, mm -hmm. I'm not a programmer by any, any means and but mm -hmm. that I think is I would imagine there's probably a great many lessons within me for the modern game programmer. Oh, I, how, how to optimise code and that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> one of one of the things that I'm quite interested in is uh, I, I love my old systems, but some of the some of the the games that are coming out now for stuff like the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, the Vectrex. Uh, I mean, I've I got myself a Vectrex uh, sort of flash cart a couple of weeks ago, and I mean, some of the games that are out for that. There's one uh, it's called Yet Another Space Invaders, and it is for all intents and purposes arcade perfect. Arcade Perfect Space Invaders, it's probably the best home version of Space Invaders I've ever seen. Yeah. And we're talking about a, a, a system that probably came out you know, 35 years ago, yeah. and it can run about 3K of uh, memory, whatever. And it's the same with Atari uh, 2600. I mean, our very own uh, Jamie Hampshire, he put um, The Wicked Father. I mean, that's awesome what he does, you know, the, the music and that kind of stuff. And there's a, a guy uh, that I know, he, d he designs games for the 2600, and he one of the games he put out was... Uh, What's the name of the game? Juno First, and it's absolutely astonishing. I mean, even the sound is almost arcade perfect. Mm. You know, if only they had that knowledge thirty years ago, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have moved on from Atari Twenty Six Hundred. Yeah, uh, it's incredible. And the same is true now, isn't it? I mean, if you look at some of the later games on something like the the Three Sixty mm. compared to the early stuff, you know, I guess the longer these things are out, the more the programmers are able to yeah yeah squeeze out of them. That's right. Brilliant. <clears throat> um, well, you've already mentioned that one. Oh, this is one I think we've spoken about before. Um, have you found that your obvious sort of Twitch gaming reaction skills 
have, have there ever been of any use in real life? Do you find that you can bring it into real life or anything at all? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Until they invent something that requires a trackball and three buttons. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, I, I was talking to... Um, I was talking to John Studley about this recently, and we, we, we were talking about how um, how certain games appeal to certain people. So, um, you know, taking someone like John, jo John's game is Pac-Man, and I suppose there's a certain pre precision with Pac-Man and, and a certain level of OCD. You, you, you know, you, you've got to collect all of the dots and then in John's case you've got to eat all, all the ghosts and you've got to go get a perfect game and, and, and that's what he's striving for and he's I'm sure he's going to do it um, very mm -hmm. soon um, but that to me it just doesn't appeal to me at all I, I think I would be bored stiff by that so what I like about Miss Command is um, I can fly by the seat of my pants and it holds my interest so there's a there's a safe way to play Missile Command, and there's a harder way to play Missile Command, and I and I tend to play the harder way. I tend to pick stuff off individually, as as opposed to doing the traditional spread that a lot of people do across the middle of the screen. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And the only reason for that is I get bored. So, to, I don't know. Sort of turning your question slightly on its head, I I, I would suspect that um, something within my psyche is drawn to Missile Command because it holds my interest. Because every game is different, there are no patterns to learn. It, it, it just throws a set of scenarios at you, and you have to deal with it. Aye, aye. Um, so I, that, that's one thing I've never actually asked you before, Tony. See, when the missiles come down, like on the first screen, is it always the same missiles, or is it is, there a, is it actually random? Yeah, completely random. Is it really? Ah, right. Okay, so there are cases yeah. where, where you get familiar scenarios, but in terms of their actual traje trajectory and which cities they're going for. Yeah, it's completely randomised. Mm -hmm. What about the, uh, like, you get the planes coming across and you get the weak kind of homing missiles, uh, do they always appear in the same levels or do they appear at certain points in the game depending on score? Or? Yeah, they all, appear, um, they all appear at certain points um, within the game, but in terms of their individual trajectories and how they react to yeah. explosions that you fire up, that's all completely random. Random. So that's it's probably quite a, a unique game as far as like early games go. Most of the games are probably set and you know they follow the same patterns, but this one's actually is random. So I think so. Yeah. It's, yeah. As I say, that there's there's you learn a th you learn the theory of playing missile command. It's kind of like driving, you know. You learn how to drive, and as you drive, you come up to a junction, or there might be a bus coming towards you, or you might go off road you might go up a hill down a hill so you you can only kind of go go through the motions of driving in order to get better at being a driver and and, and i think the same is true of missile command mm -hmm. there isn't anything specific to learn because it's always going to be different however you look at it you can drive the same commute to work every morning but there will always be something different happening mm -hmm. get something mm -hmm. on a milk float there might be no traffic at all it might be snowing it might be raining the sun might be out, it might be light, it might be dark. It's it's very similar to Missile Command. Mm -hmm. The same elements are going to be there. You're always going to have missiles. There are always going to be smart bombs. The planes yeah. are going to come across. Um, you have to defend your cities. You get the same number of missiles. But every scenario that's thrown at you is completely different. Mm -hmm. oh, brilliant. I never actually realised that. <clears throat> Uh, now I know you've got a passion for buying uh, old rundown cabs, which we've obviously we've spoke about in restoring them. Yep. Um, how did that come about, and well, how many have you got now? I think you've told us already. What what kind of sparked the kind of the, the restoring them thing in you? I think so. We, we were talking earlier about um, how much time we spend playing games, and, and that's kind of ramped down for me. And it, it's the hobby's really sort of turned into more of a restoration and an, in, and an interest in the history of these things and, and, a, and, a, and a desire to um, preserve these cabs which you know meant a great deal to us when when we were younger um, so it, 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 it probably started when when I got hold of my missile command and um, to see one of Archer's re restorations is really quite inspiring because mm -hmm. the level of detail that that guy goes to is just beyond anything mm -hmm. I would even uh, yeah, you met. You mentioned that he used to collect cabs. Does he still? Does he not do that any longer? I don't think he does. I'm, I, 
I, I, I, I can't speak for Archer because I, I haven't spoken to him for a long time. I think he got rid of the bulk of them in having really? family and, and, and sort of work commitments and stuff. So, um, you know, I think it. I, I think at one time he must have had around 100 cabs. Um, uh, I would imagine he's just purely got a handful now. So some of the cabs which he's restored and which he, he, he's owned have started turning up for sale on forums quite quite recently. So, mm -hmm. yeah, as far as I know, he's uh, dropped a lot of cabs. Started to, yeah, cop bike and dummy. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've, I've got a small collection here in my games room of, um, of seven cabs. You know, step away, you can see. That's my, um, I've got a, a, a red restored Donkey Kong and a, and a missile command. Yep, yep. There. Um, hang on, I'm going to pick the camera up. Over there in the corner is a... Oh, is your little cocktail one, yeah. Nintendo Space Fever. That was your, that was one you got about a year ago, I think it was, eh? And that was a yeah. pretty bad neck when you got it, yeah. About a year ago. And that's um, still working, amazingly. And then over on this corner, I've got a... Lovely. A, a, <laughs> that's a mini Asteroids Cabaret. Did you just store that one as well, Tony? Yeah. Yeah, yeah from top to bottom. Beautiful. That's a cabaret centipede. And then Very nice. next to it is a is a tempest in exactly the same style cab. <laughs> so um obviously we call them jammer cabs, but it's the same sort of principle. So the, those two are from Atari Island. And as you can see they're exactly the same shape. So again the, the, the sort of early days of Atari thinking about ways of saving money. Ah, right, right, yep, yep. So what you can see is, you know, the marquees are the same size, the control panels are the same size, the monitors. So they could easily flip out flip out a PCB right. and put a new one in, yeah. So they, they would just produce them with, you can see, the, the wood effect sides. Mm -hmm. And then they just sort of stuck whatever side are on in the middle of it. Very nice. So have you got space for any more in that room? I think I have, yeah. I think I've got, um, <laughs> I've probably got space for... How many more? Don't know. Um, probably space for about two more, I think. But um, you can see I've kind of gone for the smaller cabs because we're up in the mm -hmm. um, the loft area of my house. Yeah, so that was a loft conversion very, you had. It's very difficult to take advantage of the of the slopey roofs because mm -hmm. you know typically sort of six foot tall. So I've gone for um, smaller cabs in for the most part, um, mm -hmm. so, so I can mm -hmm. get the maximum amount in, but. I've got two more in the garage, which I think I'm, I'm going to get up at some point. Um, but you see these guys where it's, it, it, you know, it, it, it's clearly gone out, got out of hand for them, <laughs> and their entire house is full of arcade games. <laughs> um, obviously, I've, I've got other people to consider in the house, so unfortunately, I can't do that. But yeah, there, there are stories of guys who um, have collected cabs and just couldn't stop, couldn't help themselves, and just kept going. And um, it's a very funny story on a on a UK collectors forum of a guy was saying he realised it was time to sell a few cabs when he realised that in order to get into his kitchen he had to clamber through a Star Wars cockpit machine. <laughs> so there was nowhere else to put it but in the doorway of his kitchen. So he'd be making a cup of coffee and literally clambering through a clambering through a, a Star Wars cockpit game. That's yeah, that's <laughs> That's when you realise it's it's got a bit out of hands. So. Where's the toilet about me? Oh, I just go past the centipede cab, turn left, and you'll come in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I've, 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 I'm yeah. very fortunate to have this space here, and, and um, you're out the way. Yeah, kind of reminds me not not to go mad and just keep buying stuff. So. Aye, aye. Have you got a, a can you, a holy grail machine that you would you would love to own? You might not ever get to own. Is there a machine that you would? Yeah, or have you got? I'd, I'd quite like a, um, sorry, I'd love to own a cockpit missile command machine. A cockpit, sorry? A cockpit missile command. Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, it's, it, for all intents and purposes, that the upright version of the machine, but you're completely enclosed within a... Um, oh, I don't know, I've actually seen one of these before. Cockpit environment, yeah, there's, there's I think there's, there's two in this country, but uh, most of them are in, in the US, but again, there are very few of those around in, in the world. Um, and the reason there's so few is not only it, it, it's old, but they are absolutely enormous. Right, so right. How I'd even get that in the house and upstairs, <laughs> I've got no idea. But um, yeah, that's quite a nice pipe dream, maybe one day. Mm -hmm. When you win the lottery, bye. 
<laughs> Good stuff. And my dogs are kicking off. Stop it! Stop it! They're just playing my chew. I can hardly hear you. <laughs> There's no bloody kids, it's dogs. Um, right, oh, thanks for that, Tony. <clears throat> Obviously, we can't have a discussion about missile command and not mention uh, one particular person who you probably know I'm going to talk about, Mr. Roy Schilt, okay. or to give him his alter ego, Mr. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to stop this and I'm going to let people see a little video with Roy. Be seated. I want you to remember that no punk bastard ever got a gnarly piece of poom tang by being sensitive and considerate. Mr. Awesome, how did you come up with the idea of Mr. Awesome? Mr. Awesome is my nickname as a professional video game player. I've been the world champion in the Guinness Book of World Records since 1983, and no one's ever beat me on my specialty missile command. And as a result, I received the nickname Mr. Awesome, and I've been using it ever since. Mr. Awesome, why do you want to be a celebrity? Well, celebrity is a very subjective term. I, I believe that I, be, I should be like king for a day. I mean, I've seen the world champion cherry pit spitter on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. And if that guy should be on The Tonight Show, at least I can just, just be a celebrity for a day. I didn't even get that. I got no recognition at all. I didn't get to be on any television shows. It's like, it's like I was a ghost, and I just don't feel it's right, and I, I just want a little recognition, I'm not necessarily to become a celebrity. Some of my statistics, including my sperm count and my IQ, and sure enough, I've met a lot of nice women, and, and I even had some conversations with Madonna Shikoni, the rock star, and a few others, and it, it, it was an amazing experience, and I'd like to share it with the readers of Mr. Awesome, the comic book life of Roy Schilt. You get to read all about it, how, who I met, and what I did, and how, the, how to work the program yourself. Uh, if, if you really want to meet girls, I suggest posing in Playgirl and putting your phone number there. Batman's got his vanity plates. Mr. Awesome's got to have his. Is there anything that you would like to tell the young people of the world, given a chance to say whatever you want to say to the human race on this camera? I'd say follow your dream. Don't give up. Follow your dream. Because to me, myself... I'd rather hold out for the long shot than settle for second best. And whatever dream you're pursuing, I'd say just keep chasing it down until you get it. Okay, sorry about that, Tony. We just had a, a slight technical hitch where my computer crashed, big still. Yeah, anyway, that's uh, Mr. Schilt and all, all his uh, glory. Could you tell the viewers, Tony, what is Roy Schilt all about? Where did he come from? Well, <laughs> I don't know what he's all about. Um, so Roy is... Um, one of the more colourful characters of the world of classic arcade gaming. And um, unfortunately for me, um, Roy was the world record holder on Missile Command. So uh, Roy uh, was without question the best Missile Command player back in the day, in the 80s. And the record which I beat in 2005 was set in 1984. So it stood for, um, what's that? 84 to... Just over 20 years. Aye, aye. Um, and, uh, you know, Roy... Um, Roy's very passionate about his achievement on Missile Command and he's very uh, very defensive about the whole thing and he, he uh, developed this character in the 80s called Mr. Awesome, <laughs> which he uh, would use to, um, you know, promote himself and... I think he was sort of trying to use Missile Command to um, uh, become famous and, and to sort of, you know, turn himself into into something. And uh, he was a bit of a bit of a bodybuilder back in the day as well. Quite impressive uh, physique, if I say so myself, back in the day. Um, yeah, these are your words, Al, not mine. <laughs> um, have you seen the more recent video? I did, the one you posted a couple of days ago. Was that taken fairly recently? Yeah, did I post that a couple of times? You did, yeah, you stuck it in Rodent. Ah, you put it in Rodent a few weeks, uh, oh, last no, week. Oh, yeah, 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 that, that one. Uh, yeah. I mean, was that taken fairly recently? That was, yeah, last week. I mean, you could tell when he was, you could tell he's obviously still working out. <laughs> he's yeah. A stranger. 
So, That's you know, strange. Roy um, Roy was um, very interested in me when I sort of turned up on the scene and um, spent a lot of time emailing me and sort of questioning my score and questioning the settings I was on, trackball settings as a whole, another five hours of conversation there. Um, and um, he's, I haven't really heard from him in recent years, thankfully, I think he's sort of backed off now. Um, but yeah, so in the early days, it, it, it was it was quite something to be, you know, turning up on on the scene and thinking, well, yeah, I'm just a guy who plays Missile Command, and I, I happen to get the world record. You know, the consequences of which are you know, <laughs> the impact of a ton of feathers on the world. I, I'm, I'm well aware of where being the Missile Command world champion sits in the grand scheme of things, and it ain't that important, you know. Um, but to Roy, it was. It's, it's always been something quite big, so I think when I came along and, and trumped his score, he, he, he was looking for all sorts of angles to um, discredit my score and uh, you know me as a player. But mm -hmm. from what I understand, that's nothing new. And I and I think um, I think if you speak to any, anybody within the scene, I think they'll all have a sort of similar opinion. I mean, he, he comes across as he's quite a physical person. He comes across as quite intimidating, almost threatening. Is that the kind of the, the, the way you feel about the guy? I mean, do no, people talk quite, about him like that, or is he no, not quite harmless? Do you think? I think I've had the advantage of having the the Atlantic Ocean between me and mm -hmm. so I I think there are probably some American citizens who have a slightly different opinion of him. But um, you know, I I. I I certainly respect Roy as a player. There's no, there's no question the guy knows how to play Missile Command, and, and there are very few of us who can play at that sort of level. Yeah. Um, but I think he's, he's. I think it's very easy to get sort of sucked into the argument, and I think it's very easy to get sucked into having a sort of one-on-one -on -one battle with Roy. But he's kind of one of those people that you will, you will never win. So <laughs> he's one of those people who has an opinion. Um, you can lay out as many facts as you like to discredit or disprove what he's been saying. Um, but then you take a step back and you look at yourself responding to him and you think, I, I'm just wasting my time here, you know. Aye, I've aye. sort of set my bit and that's it. Um, what's unfortunate about Roy is, is, he is he is quite eloquent and I think he um, comes across well um, when, he, when he talks. So I think he's quite media friendly. And I think any anybody doing anything about Missile Command or classic arcade gaming, as you probably saw from from King of Kong, they 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 kind of come across this character and they think we need to have him in our film. And I think I would too. If I, I mean, if I was oh, I think he's a bit of an enigma. <laughs> you know, I think if I was doing a, um, you know, if someone paid me some money to do a classic arcade gaming documentary, especially one about Missile Command, well. There's, there's no question, you know, <laughs> ha having Roy involved in that has had a bit of sort of um, colour and um, depth. Yeah. So, so he's, he's a heck of a character. and um, You've never met him in real life though, have you? Never, never met him. him. No. Touch wood. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm already thinking that you've you've invited him for a one-to-one, -one, a face-off type thing at, at Twin Gat at... Uh, you know, a game spot, and he's never a fun spot. Sorry, and he's never taken you up on on that offer. Been a few. Um, there's there's been a few, few sort of challenges thrown across the Atlantic from both of us. Um, so he he would. Um, this is going back some time. So I mean, there, there was one time where he said, um, uh, "Right, you and you and I need to play head to head, and I'm playing." two weeks Thursday in this arcade in Los Angeles. I'm asking you to be there to play me and I, I expect you to turn up. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, all that aside, I'm, I'm, I'm five and a half thousand miles away. What makes you think I, I could jump on a plane, fly to Los Angeles to play a game? I can, you know. Mm. And then, of course, when I didn't show up, he would announce to the world that Tony was a no and you know, <laughs> if that doesn't prove that I'm not a true world champion, then what does? You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is, what's what's his highest score? What was it? His highest score before one point eight. 
Well, his, his world record was 1.6, but um, apparently it's now 1.8 million points. Um, I've, I've not seen the gameplay. I've, I've not seen any of the footage, but mm. that, that supposedly is the score which has been registered on the um, Twin Galaxies platform. So, so you have more than doubled his score then, so he's not even in the same ballpark now, is he? Yeah, I have. And, um, so, you know, there's no doubt the guy can play, um, but he has this hang-up about trackball settings which um i was yeah i won't, I won't go yeah. into in in a great deal of depth but there's a dip switch within the machine which adjusts the sensitivity of the trackball and um in very simple terms the setting that roy plays on means you have to work the trackball harder to get it around the screen the setting which i play on um you um arguably less effort is required to move the trackball the same distance. So what you gain in pace, um, you lose in accuracy. So if you're tr controlling this mm. trackball with a, with, a, with, 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 with a lot more sensitivity, you need to be a lot more precise in your movement of it. And where the argument comes in is one of those settings was designed for the smaller two and a half inch trackball because it's a smaller ball, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other setting is for the larger four and a half inch track ball, which is um, you plan on the upright right ma machine. So you think, well, where's the argument? The argument is Atari produced three different versions of the manual for the upright machine, and in that manual, one of one of the settings says the track ball setting doesn't matter. In the other version, it says you should have it in the on position. And in the final version of the um, manual, it should be in the off position. And the fact of the matter is Atari produced those three different versions of the manual. So what that means is there are cabs out there which are set with the switch on and some which are set to the switch off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And back in the day, you, you I didn't even know what a dip switch setting was. You just turned up at a machine, you put 10p in and you started playing. Yeah, yeah. Every trackball was different. Um, and it's only since I be his score that this has suddenly be, be, become a hot topic for him and, and you know it's it's suppose according to him it's the difference between me and him and that he plays Aye. so he says on the slow setting and yeah. I will openly admit well I sit on the setting which is in the manual that I have which is in the back door sheet on the back door sheet of my cabinet which says the switch should be off and that's just mm -hmm. my preferred set setting. Mm -hmm. so, and in your opinion I mean do you think it's easier or harder or do you think there's really no difference it's just doing a preference? My preference is to have the switch off. I think the game is unplayable with it on. Um, but there are other people who play with the setting on who look at me and they say, how on earth can you play with the setting off? It's just impossible. It's, you, you, you can't control the, uh, the trackball. So um, to resolve that, Twin Galaxies came out and said, look, it's just player's choice. There's a great deal of conflicting information out there. There's no question that some machines are on and some machines are set to the off setting. So, mm -hmm. As far as we're concerned, if you want to play with the on setting, that's absolutely fine. If you want to play with the off setting, equally, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, in interestingly, if if you there are a few videos out there of Roy playing Missile Command, and there is no question that he's 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 playing on the same setting that I play on, and yet he will stand in front of a camera and deny that. Really, yeah. And he'll yeah. say, "I only play on the on setting," and that's that. You say, "Well, you know, <laughs> being." Um, one one of the better missile command players around. I, I would like to think that I sort of trust my own judgment as to what I, as to what I'm seeing. And many videos that I've seen of Roy playing, there is absolutely no question. Um, he's playing at the quicker strike ball. Uh, it's been on, on the off setting. Because, like mm -hmm. I say, you, you, you will walk up to a machine, you'll drop a coin, and you'll start playing, and, and you'll you'll just start playing, and, and and you'll deal with the track ball as it is, and. Mm -hmm. My trackball at home plays at a certain speed. When I go to uh, America, uh, so uh, take Funspot, which is in New Hampshire, for example, their trackball, I would say, is about a third quicker than the trackball that I play on. So, it, it's, to my mind, it's a non-argument. You know, it, it, it's, it's every single trackball will play differently. Some have been looked after well. Some get serviced regularly, like mine. I, I will put a little drop of oil in, in mm -hmm. mine just to, just to keep it... Um, lubricated but there's there's no question the bulk of machines out there um, aren't serviced properly 
and mm-hmm. they, they will sit there for months not being played. So the, the bearings and the rollers might be worn, um, they might be stiffened up, they may not be serviced, you know, since the cab was put on location 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. You, you've just got to deal with it. You, you just put a coin in and stuff. Like. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I've yet to meet Roy. Um, you know, maybe one day it will happen and maybe um, uh, <laughs> he, he seems to be in a good place now. He's got um, uh, one of his missile command scores recognised by Guinness because he's pounded them to death and they literally, <laughs> as I understand it, have given him a certificate to basically make him go away. Um, Is he married? Say again? Is he married? I believe he is, yeah. I think is he? Aye, aye. Kids as well. I, actually, I was actually watching a video and I think it was, well, the video was put up, I think, 2001. I don't know how, how old the actual video is itself, but, I mean, he must have, for all um, he is, he's, he must be quite well known. I mean, the, he was on the Howard Stern show. Have you seen that mm. that particular one? Yeah. And they were basically, I actually felt sorry for the guy. They were basically just ripping up my ribbons, taking the absolute piss out of the guy. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> I look at, I mean, once I kind of got over the, you know, who is this guy following me around? And we, um, he sent a PI to um, tail me at a fun spot tournament in 2006. And um, some of the footage is on YouTube where this, this guy had a camera unbeknownst to me and started talking to me about Missile Command. I had no idea who this guy was and I'm happy to talk to him. And he had a camera down by his side, down by his waist, which, which was on, unbeknownst to me. And it, it's sort of footage of me talking back in 2006 to this guy who was just showing an interest in the game, as as, as people do. Um, and it turns out it was Roy paid paid a private investigator <laughs> to turn up at this arcade and start Bloody following hell. myself and Paul Drury around. And Jeez, yeah. I don't know. It, I, I, it's a, it, it's a video game, um, <laughs> but you know he's 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 a Roy's a character. I think he's I think he's quite amusing, and um, I would say, arguably, if it wasn't for characters like him, then you know maybe the hobby would be a little a lesser, lesser place. Totally agree with so, you. So I mean, it's you know it, it certainly made the whole sort of missile command thing for me a damn sight more interesting. Aye, um, definitely. Just beating a score, you know, I've, I've had this. You know, bizarre, colourful character um, running around who is arguably the sort of complete opposite of me, which again kind of makes it quite interesting. So. <laughs> I remember a while back, Tony, you mentioned about the possibility of a, a, a film based on it. Was that yeah, under a go or that? Few, yeah. There's been a few things yeah. um, bounded around. There's, there's, there's been a few noises made about a Missile Command documentary um, along the lines of King of Kong. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I understand it, it's, as soon as people have sort of spent any period of time with with Roy, I think they've kind of backed away, thinking mm-hmm. this is this is going to be pretty much hard work. <laughs> and I think the logistics involved of me me on on, on one yeah, side of yeah. and him on another. Um, I'm not sure it'll happen. So I, he's you know I think he's moved on. He I I don't think he plays anymore. I don't think he he has really played. no. Um, but he's still out there. He still makes his presence felt, and um, you know, good luck to him. I, 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 I've no doubt one day <laughs> our paths will will cross, and maybe we can share a beer and have a laugh and play a couple of fun games <laughs> in Soul Command. But uh, I'm, I'm just not. I'm just not sure he's capable of doing that. Like, Any guy that uses the word uh, is it chumpasize and the uh, putang is don't good put, in my book. Don't get chumpasized. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Uh, I think we've covered all these. Uh... Yep. Listen, that is it, Tony. That's all my questions, mate. Just, Thank just you very on, much. Just on Royale, I, I think the, the the sort of best thing, rather than me, you know, I'm 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 probably slightly biased because I've had to deal with Roy pretty much in my face, albeit via email or YouTube videos. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm probably quite biased, but uh, I, if anyone's interested, I, I would just encourage them to go on Google or YouTube and. Um, Google Roy and just kind of form their own opinion. <laughs> He's a fascinating character for he sure, is, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Is. Yeah, but I wait. So that's that's all my questions, Tony. Thanks for that. Um, now I've got a few questions from some of uh, of the viewers. I hope you don't mind me uh, going over. I think probably some of you actually answered already. Yeah. Uh, Jamie uh, Williamson is asking, "How cool is it to have such a phonetically pleasing name, <laughs> Tony Temple?" <laughs> yeah, it's like a like a porn star's name, isn't it? Some 
some some people say, um, I don't know. It's it, it, that, it, yeah, it's, that's just it's the one you were given. It's the one I was given. It's the one. I, <laughs> although I think technically I should be an Anthony because um, there's an H in my name. So I think technically you're not supposed to shorten Anthony. Uh, are you? But right, it always right. has been. Um, yeah. What do you put in when you get a high score? What's your name? What do you put in? TT. Yeah. T- that's what I guess Al. <laughs> TT with a letter to spare. <laughs> um, what are your? Uh, this is Jamie again. What are your earliest memories of Missile Command? Was it Love at First Sight? Was that in, in Rita's Cafe? Was it or was that in yeah. Mad Harry's? Yeah, it was in the cafe. I, I think it probably was. It, it, like I say, I, I, I distinctly remember this sort of neon glow coming through steamed up windows in this cafe, and I remember you know, walking in and, and looking at this control panel and thinking, Jesus, Christ, you know, what's this? What this big bowling ball? Um, and it, it is a, it is a... Is it, I was going to ask you that, is it a, it's not is it an actual bowling ball, is it? it? It's a standard American, um, I think they call it a, can, a, a candle pin bowl. Oh, right. Which is not the same size as the big things. Yeah, know, but smaller, right? Aye, aye. So sort of four and a half inches. But yeah, it's it's it. That's all it is. Um, mm. And it and it sits on two rollers, which are sort of set. Can you see that? You can sort of set. Aye, like, like, like a mouse kind of thing. It, it's sitting like, at ninety degrees to the mouse, yeah. I think. And one tracks the x axis, and the other tracks yep. the y axis. Up and down, so aye, aye. You see on the screen. And these and these three fire buttons and uh, the, the the side art, you know, I I think it's one of the one of the better examples of um, Atari's sort of you know gaudy um, side art, and it, I was just drawn to the whole thing and mm-hmm. um, just that kind of um, adrenaline rush of, of playing it, and it's it's probably the only game which, which still gives gives me a buzz even now. With, I, Wonder how many games I've played over the years, but you know, thousands literally. And, yeah, and yeah. It, when, when it gets up to the stages where you're really being challenged, it 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 it, it still gives me a you know mm-hmm. a good sort of adrenaline kick. So yeah, it probably was um, love at first sight. I, mm-hmm. For me, it's it's one of the most um, aesthetically pleasing '80s cabs, and it's just a real a real icon. You know, if you wanted to take a photograph of a of a of a classic. Um, 80s arcade cabinet, you know, Missile Command's it because it's got it's got the artwork. It's there's something going on on the screen, and you know, yeah. Mm-hmm. Were, they, were they, the fire buttons were they not smaller as well than the bigger ones, or were they? Were they yeah, they the are same they're, size. They're, 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 they're called cone buttons, and right. they're little um, cherry cherry switches, um, as opposed to the, the sort of more traditional like uh, the sort of big white button you would find on an astro ah, like the ones in your Space Donkey Kong camp they're, they're, they're sort of small and a lot yeah. of picky mm-hmm. did they light up? did they light up at all? no no only the stop no. buttons lit up. was it? ah right aye, aye. yeah and then of course you've got the whole which we haven't touched on is is the um, what was going on in the 80s at the time um, so the whole subject matter is probably very amiss of us not 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 to have even mentioned that as, as yet but I've no doubt that the, um, the the subject matter of missile command, um, as you'll know, you know, being in your teens in the eighties and Ronald Reagan and the Star Wars program and you know the, <clears throat> the Russians, yep. the Russians were still the enemy. And as a as a naive kid, all you saw was the Americans with all their nuclear missiles and Russia with all their nuclear missiles and little old Blighty sat in the middle, and you know. There was a fear, the whole duck and cover thing. You know, that there, there was a real fear that you know mm-hmm. um, nuclear war was a real threat. Whereas the threat now is terrorism in all sorts of guises. You know, but yeah. Think of that threat now, but it, it, back in the eighties, the the real big global threat to us all was, um, you know, mankind annihilating itself by pushing the button. And uh, yeah, yeah, missile command without question was inspired by that whole subject matter. So. Probably subconsciously, I, I suspect there was a, a a bit of the macabre about wanting sort to, of real life fear, yeah, yeah, yeah. to play missile command, and mm-hmm. of course that that huge explosion at the end of the game. It's just it's, I, the, end. the end, the end. <laughs> just all of that yeah. iconic stuff really was of its time, and um, I would suggest that that was probably a big appeal mm. um, of the game as well. Well, funny you should mention that. I mean, actually, I was at uh, Tracy and myself. We went off for a um, 
Ava was away to uh, France with the school, so we went up to Perth and Aberdeen for a, a sort of week. And uh, there's one of these, what's called the secret, uh, the secret bunker. And the story goes, uh, a guy, this house in uh, in Fife was up for sale, and this guy went to buy it, and he got it for like sixty thousand pounds, and. Uh, he, he noticed this door was kind of boarded off. He thought, what the hell is this? Him and his brother opened the door, fucking torch. Big, massive sort of tunnel, 500 feet going down the way. What's this? Turns out it was a bloody three-storey nuclear bunker. Um, it was opened in 1945, I think it was. Wow. And then after the sort of like the Cold War kind of died down a wee bit, it just became sort of like a storeroom. But then when the whole thing kicked off in the 80s again, it became, it was, you know, put back into use. Uh, and we went to visit it and it was, uh, well, what made it double interesting for us is uh, because we were there when the kids were at school, Tracy and I were the only two people in the whole place and it literally felt like you had just sort of you shouldn't have been in there. Mm. You're walking about and through through uh, money from the government they've they've kinda of put all this stuff back in. Um, you know, it's just as it would have been back in the eighties. But uh, I actually did a video um of it and it's all about the Cold War and I've featured games like uh, what do you call it? Raid over Moscow, Missile Command. Um there's also a game called what was it? Uh, Theatre Europe. And it was basically the Warsaw Pact versus NATO. And uh, I mean, I, when I was playing it just for the video, I really got a, a chill right up the back of my spine because, uh, you know, you press the button to well, you, you launch a nuclear missile and you just see these little things going. <laughs> then you get the big. <laughs> and the whole screen's shaking and it's like, whoa. And I, I can always remember the, the first time I saw Missile Command was in a cafe. And it was right, obviously right, just what you were saying, right at the time of the Cold War. And I remember looking at this thing and feeling quite scared, thinking, mm. bloody hell, this, this is real, this is real. Look, there's video games with nuclear war in it. It was quite frightening because it was a genuine possible reality, you know. It was, yeah, it, 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 I think it was going to be, um, the original plan for the machine was for it to be a lot more stark than it is now. So um, it was originally going to be called um, Armageddon. But they felt that was perhaps just a bit too <laughs> kind of um, stepping over the line, and maybe people wouldn't understand what the word even meant. Um, mm -hmm. and one of the more interesting things that Dave Boyer has um, said that Dave's the guy who wrote Missile Command. He said the original plan for the machine was it to, was to have the ability for it to be localized. So oh, it, right. was based, <laughs> it was going to be based on the west coast of. Um, America, for example, they were going to name the cities, so you could flip flip a dip switch to set it for the west coast of America, and the cities would be called Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, Portland, uh, Las Vegas. Really? You know, aye, aye, wow. And then if it was on the east coast of America, you'd flip a different switch, and it would be Boston, New York, um, <laughs> etc. Et and the hell, there, were, yeah. there were plans for a sort of European setting, so you'd have London, Paris, Moscow. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think for probably for just kind of cost and programming, and no one would bother flipping the switch. It, it, mm -hmm. it was all re removed, so mm -hmm. yeah, it was going to be a lot more intense than, um, than probably just a bit too near to the knuckle because uh, it was yeah. quite a yeah. terrifying prospect. Yeah, they also, re Oof. as I understand it, they also initially replicated the sweep of a radar screen. Oh, right, right, aye, aye, aye. It wasn't kind of always on. You, you would get a sort of ah, right, aye, aye. A sort of ra looking into a radar screen effect, but again, it, it was sort of removed for gameplay reasons. So the game mm -hmm. could have been quite different to how it eventually turned. Is there anything? Uh, is there anything that you would like like to have changed about the game? Is there anything you think could have made it better? Is there anything that annoys you about the game? Mm, if I could, I suppose it, it it would be it would be nice to remove some of the bugs in the game, um, and aye, aye. a handful of bugs. Um, and it's also got the, um, I don't know what you call it, a, a, a rollover screen, a kill screen, a split screen, much like Donkey Kong and Pac-Man. So it, it's screen 256, the difficulty restarts. So again, it, 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 it would be nice if someone could reprogram it and um, remove some of those bugs. But outside of that, just in terms of pure gameplay terms, I think it's absolutely perfect. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that nobody's actually has actually taken the code and rewritten it. You know, yeah, a few people have. So there is a, 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 a 
there is a ROM set out there where they fix the bug, the bonus city bug that I mentioned earlier. Mm. Um, but I think again, most people who want to play the game um, regard that as a good goal. Mm. If you can hit the bug score at eight hundred and ten thousand points, that's a that's a good target to go for. Um, and obviously, with that remove. With that, Nope, oh, you still there, Tony? It's kind of going a bit haywire. Yeah, I'm still here. There's a bit of a glitch there, wasn't it? Ah, yeah, aye, you're kind of... I can't see the video at the moment. Okay, Smashing, um, what is it about Missile Command that inspires such devotion in you? I think you've kind of touched on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think originally it was the just the challenge of the game. It was something genuinely different. And um, in, in later years, obviously, it's been the sort of p pursuit of the of the world record. Mm -hmm. Good, excellent. Uh, how many hours a day did you need to practice to kind of get to that level? Um, to get the world record score, I mean, I, 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 I was playing every other day, and then probably in the, in the two weeks leading up to actually achieving the score, I, I was playing it every night for probably a couple of hours. Um, now I probably play once a fortnight when I mm -hmm. when I remember. Mm -hmm. That I need to play it as well as. <laughs> Do you always just play it just to keep your hand in, sort of thing? Yeah, it's good to just yeah. sit down and have a, have a quick. Because you never know when you're going to be asked to appear at one of these uh, exhibition things and, yeah, and it, it's, go up on the stage. Yeah. It's also nice to just play the game and not have to think about setting up a camera because back, you know, a few years back, it would be, well, I can't play without setting up a camera just in case this is the game. <laughs> That's so it, true. It, it's kind of nice to sort of shed that for a bit and just, aye, just aye. have fun and kind of muck around a bit. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Um, what other arcade games do you love? Um, and is there any that you'd love to hold a world record in? Yeah, I, I, I'm, Robotron is a game I, 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 I love. It's um, and I, I had a cab and um, one of my biggest re regrets was um, selling it um, about five years ago, I can't really wish I hadn't done that. But um, I've got a cabaret machine in the garage, which I'm in the middle of re restoring at the moment. So hopefully, within a couple of months, I'll I'll have a, a Robotron up here and I can start playing again. Wow, yeah. I think I play a reasonable game. Whether I'd ever end up as good as some of these guys who I watch on Twitch who, who can marathon Robotron. I mean, that's God alive. I mean, if you think Missile Command's tricky. Robotron is a killer yeah. of a game, and, and those those guys who can play it almost with their eyes shut uh, that, that's mm. that's quite something to watch. Mm. Um, I and I, I you know I think I'm drawn to games which which are really interesting to watch, and Robotron is a great spectator sport. To watch someone play Robotron at, at that sort of level is 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 quite something. Um, similarly with uh, Tempest, I, I, I think Tempest is a Glorious game, not only in terms of the way it looks with the sort of glowing mm. vectors, but um, again to watch someone play that properly to a to a world record level. Um, there's a guy called Richard Marsh in the States, and I've I've watched him play a few times at a couple of tournaments, and uh, it's just amazing, absolutely incredible. So are you going to maybe go for that? I think once you get your your Robocon, so your Robotron cab upstairs, are you going to have? Would you? I mean, or do you think you're not good enough to? Oh, I, to can he compete? I, I, yeah, I don't think I'm I'm good enough to com compete. Yeah, what's, what's your highest score so far? Um, high score rate's about three hundred and fifty thousand. That's not bad. That's three, not bad at all. Uh, I mean, it's my favourite arcade game, but I think I've done about two hundred thousand. But it's one of these games I can I can be over in ten seconds. Sometimes it's just yeah, one of these yeah, yeah. fiendishly tough Absolutely. games. <laughs> Yeah, but I that's uh, Jamie's questions. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Um, down the rabbit hole, Kevin, his name is. Um, I assume Tony has seen a high score where Bill Car sorry, Bill Carlton tries to conquer Missile Command back in two thousand and six. One thing I noticed watching that documentary was how was how just as Bill was getting deep into several hours of playing the machine, the motherboard kept freezing upon him. It made for a bit of an aggravation in the film. Did Tony run into similar hardware issues? Well, I think you've, you've mentioned you have it. Yeah, we, we um, I tend to sort of um, come across um, <clears throat> yeah, genuine sort of hard hardware failure. So where, where a button doesn't work or the machine overheats or the one of the voltages dies or a capacitor dry, uh, uh, dies up or, or you know it, it just simply breaks down 
in the Phil High School, which, which is really worth watching because it's a. It, I've it, seen it. Yeah, it's good. It's a great humor story. The the problems that Bill encountered were a um, uh, like a perfect storm of various things happening within the game, which, which caused the game to crash. So what Bill experienced wasn't necessarily thirty-year-old hardware breaking down. It, it was actually the game was crashing. So I mean, oh right, right, yeah. So I mentioned about the. Um, the uh, reset screen on Missile Command. When you hit wave 256, the gameplay restarts and it starts again from the first screen. Couple that with the bonus city count. So we mentioned earlier that mm -hmm, in the marathon mm -hmm. settings, you, you can build up a big, um, a big reserve of bonus cities in the background. That that also rolls over at 256. So they all go, they all disappear. Yeah. So <laughs> all right, right, right. you can have two hundred and fifty six bonus cities in reserve. If you get one more, you've suddenly got one bonus city in reserve. So <laughs> there's that going on as well. Um so it's 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 hard to explain, um, but a combination of those two things happening at the same time will cause the game to crash. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what Victor Sandberg, who's the marathon world record holder, was able to work out is what what he needed to do in order for those yeah, things to not that. to occur at the same mm -hmm. time, causing mm -hmm. the machine to crash. So, mm -hmm. if if you watch some of the like, gameplay of that marathon game, you'll see Victor walking away from the machine for you know anything up to ten minutes, basically killing off his cities, and, and killing off some of those bonus cities so that he didn't run into trouble. He kept it below two hundred and fifty six, basically. I, yeah, I see. Essentially, so yeah, so yeah. um, yeah, to play missile command on a on marathon settings, there, there's a few challenges you need to um, con consider, as well as how you're going to stay awake for three days. Is that was it? Was it Victor that had this sort of counter thing or something? You had a yes. counter. Aye, so he knew exactly how many cities he had. Yeah. So what Aye. he was doing there was counting how many cities he had, which is quite a difficult thing to keep track of, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you might have earned one bonus city, but you might have lost three cities on that particular screen. So yeah. So you've got to add one on, and to try and do that in your head and still play the game and remember where you are is quite difficult. So, <laughs> so Victor built himself like like a counter, which he, you know, added up and took away how many cities he had at the end of each screen. Mhm, mm mhm. Mm Interesting, brilliant stuff. Two to go. Um, Rick sixty four. Couple of questions, please, uh, for Tony. Has Tony ever played Liberator also by Atari? Uh, and what did you think of it? I have, yeah. It's it's lib liberated. Can't say I've heard it. Actually, I've never heard it. It's sort of regarded as the um, as the follow on to Missile Command, and it's it's kind of like Missile Command in in, in reverse. So you uh, you see a globe with things happening on it, and your bases are actually out in space on each corner of the screen. So you're kind of firing stuff into the earth as opposed to defending stuff. Oh, I see. You're the attacker rather than defender sort of thing. Yeah. Perspective. I don't think it was terribly popular, uh, but it was certainly released. And yeah, I've played it. It's 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 pretty good. Yeah, mm -hmm. well. No, you need to look it up. Never heard of that one. And very finally, Tony, um, I quite like it, but personally I prefer Missile Command. Has Tony got any other gaming records, past or present, and is he going for any other particular records at the moment? Well, I think you've just mentioned that. Yeah. There's nothing in the radar. I've got a couple of other scores on the on the on the Twin Galaxies database. Not not really through design. It just where I happened to play a couple of games uh, at a tournament, and that there was a ref there who made a note of the score and number notes to me. Just to, just uploaded it. So um, there's there's the um, there's a game called Super Missile Attack, which was basically an upgrade to Missile Command. So you can add a few chips to the motherboard, and it makes the difficulty a lot harder. Um, I, I can play a pretty good game of that, so um, one day I, I intend getting my board out and, and, and having a crack at that. Um, but that, when that's a very high. There's a, there's a, a, a the, the high score there is 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 going to be a bit of a challenge, but um, I wouldn't mind having a go at that. Um, Centipede's a game which which I like and I'm sort of getting better at. So. You know, may, maybe I, I haven't really sort of kept up to date with with what the current high, high scores are. But again, that's mm -hmm. another game I, I wouldn't mind a crack at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good stuff. 
Well, that is it, Tony. That is us. Uh, I don't know how many hours, probably about two and a half hours worth. Um, thank you very much uh, for giving up your Sunday afternoon for me. That's pleasure. And I do apologise about the, the, the technical difficulties at the beginning. No worries. Um, it's been fantastic talking to you, and I'm sure everybody's going to have a great time watching this back. Good stuff. So, thank you very much, sir, and I shall catch you soon, eh? Pleasure. I'll take care. Take care. Cheers, buddy. Bye. Ta-da.